There is an entire video genre on YouTube that revolves around cats being jerks, and not gonna lie, it's quite wonderful to watch. Of course, we could probably just as easily put together videos of humans being jerks. I'm pretty sure I'd be in there somewhere. But that brings us to our focus of this lesson, jerkish behavior, or perhaps more appropriately put, antisocial behavior. That which is harmful to others and ultimately the community. Just like with pro-social behavior, we ask the question, are humans born with antisocial traits or do they develop it over time? And it seems like the answer, again, could be both. From a biological point of view, well, this is very easy to explain. Humans, like all creatures, have simply evolved to survive. And so if it comes down to me or you, well... It's gonna be me. We see this in all animals, in the way they fight for resources, and so it's not surprising that traits like aggression and self-preservation at all costs would be passed down in humans. But at the same time, you can't just blame biology. There's strong research that suggests that antisocial behavior is also learned through modeling and conditioning. It's another sobering thought, whether we might be teaching antisocial traits to the little eyes that watch us. But of course, it's not just the young ones who can learn antisocial behavior. We looked in a previous lesson at the power of groups in causing people to comply or conform. Well, when it comes to the influence a group can have on social behavior, we call it groupthink, and it can have serious consequences. On December 7, 1941, hundreds of Imperial Japanese aircraft bombed a US naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Thousands of lives were lost, a devastation possibly only eclipsed by the fact that the US chose not to prepare for this attack. The thinking amongst the military officers was that Japan would not dare wage war against America because they would surely lose. They believed that Pearl Harbor's naval fleet was more than enough to deter an attack. Historians now describe these rationalizations as shared illusions. The officers weren't thinking individually, but as a group, which led to this. Groupthink refers to the tendency of group members to make decisions based on maintaining group cohesion rather than critically analyzing the realities of the situation. It might be a bit uncreatively named, groupthink, but at least it's easy for us to remember. Other examples include company board members refusing to adapt their product to the times, uh, the over-the-top loyalty people can have towards a political party, and indeed against another, uh, and big issues like racism. More on this in later videos. Suffice to say, groups can cause individuals to behave antisocially when they choose not to think for themselves. But there is one unique form of antisocial behavior that occurs because of a group, but not one people normally consider themselves a part of. Here's a question. If you are in an emergency, do you think it would be better to have many people around who can help you, or few? According to psychology, you're in danger if you thought more. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passers-by, Peter uh, is an actor. Uh, As part of an experiment on bystander uh, apathy, he's pretending uh, to be ill. Help, help. Uh, How long before he gets help? Help me. Please, help me. Help. Help me Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. Please somebody help me. Bib Latine and John Daly suggested that when we're confronted with a situation that might require our assistance, we go through a five-stage process before we decide to help. First, we have to notice that there is a situation that needs help. Next, we decide whether or not we think the situation is important, if it's an emergency. Maybe because it's a sudden medical issue or something that requires immediate attention because it's life-threatening. Then we consider if we want to take the responsibility. Step four, we think about whether there actually is a way we can help. And finally, if we make it through all those stages, then we provide help. If we stop at any one of those steps, we don't provide help. In the example from before, Countless people walked right past the person lying on the ground, even though they noticed the situation and probably could tell it was an emergency. I mean, they even had a simple way to help, like ring an ambulance or the police. But psychologists suggest that the reason why no bystander intervened was right here in stage three. 
Why assume responsibility if there are so many other people around? I mean, surely someone else would help, right? This is what psychologists call the bystander effect. Study after study has shown that the larger the size of the group, the less likely an individual is going to provide help. Isn't that incredible? And conversely, if there are very few onlookers to an emergency, help is far more likely to be given. To further investigate the bystander effect, Latine and Dali conducted a study in which participants, volunteer students, were placed in individual cubicles connected by an intercom. As they talked to each other, one of the students, who was actually a confederate, pretended to have a seizure. So the question was, how would participants respond? This is what they found. When participants believed it was just the victim and them, so the number of other people available to help was zero, 85% of them attempted to call for help. But as the supposed group size increased, the less likely they were to provide help. When they thought they were in a group of six, only 30% of the participants attempted to help. In another study, Latine and Dali found that the bystander effect occurred even when a person's own safety was at risk. Participants were asked to complete a questionnaire when artificial smoke was introduced into a room. They found that when the participant was alone, over 70% of them reported the smoke within four minutes. But when there were others in the room, less than 10% reported it within the first few minutes. Even when their own health was potentially at risk, the majority failed to act. What's going on? Well, many theories have been put forth in an effort to explain the bystander effect. One suggests that when onlookers are confronted with a situation that may require their intervention, they perform a complex analysis in their minds within moments to decide whether or not to help. Let me explain. The cost-benefit analysis model, or CBA, was pioneered by a French economist, used to basically weigh up the advantages and disadvantages of decisions to select the best option that minimizes costs and maximizes benefits. So applied to the bystander effect, it describes the internal process that all onlookers go through as they decide whether or not it would benefit them to help as in benefit the bystander. I realize that's a strange way of seeing it, but Pili Evin suggested that one of the benefits it provided the bystander was reducing their distress in seeing another person's distress. Also, by helping, they might reduce the guilt associated with not helping. Whatever the reason, the cost-benefit analysis model is one explanation as to why people might behave in antisocial ways. But let's return to our poor victim for a moment. We mentioned before that one reason why no one stopped to help is because no one person had the full responsibility. The larger the crowd, the greater the responsibility was divided, and psychologists call this a diffusion of responsibility. It also explains why people are more likely to help if they're the only other person there. The responsibility is not as diffused. But it's not just about responsibility. People report that having too many others around also stops them from helping because of self-consciousness. I mean, what if you helped in an incorrect way and embarrassed yourself? This is also known as audience inhibition. And the final factor is social influence, which states that the likelihood of you helping depends on how others react to the situation. In this other simulation, watch what happens when a tour guide walks right past the victim. One by one, all the members of the group notice the person in need, but continue moving, even though some look like they did want to stop and help. I guess there's a reason why the game's called Follow the Leader. But as powerful as a negative model is, so too is a positive one. All it took in this situation was for one person to provide help, and immediately several others gather around as well. In this sense, the bystander effect works in two directions. If a crowd appears concerned, so will other bystanders. In this lesson, we've talked about reasons why humans behave antisocially, and as always, the power of the group to influence people towards negative behavior. But if you can take one more thing away from this lesson, it's that one individual can turn the tide. Even if no one else is doing it, but you know it's the right thing to do, well, it only takes one. Even if your nature and nurture tell you to put yourself first, you don't have to listen to it. Could you be the bystander who stands by someone in need?